Um, so uh, I made up some homework uh, problems, and I uh, sent this over to uh, uh, Felix al already, and uh, I think it's pretty close to the final already, including all the, uh, the chapters. So uh, it's not too many, but uh, at a, vari a variety of uh, different levels. Certain things are quite basic to understand the, what I discussed, and certain things are going beyond what I want you to learn. So a, a few problems have some kind of a simple field theory calculations. If you feel this is a little bit beyond your uh, uh, practice, that's OK. You don't have to do um, uh, as, much as, just as, as much as you can. So this evening, after dinner, I will be here to discuss and maybe give, give you some general comments, general hints, to ask you how you think and how I think you should uh, proceed with this. And uh, some of the earlier birds told me there are typos already. I asked you to find uh, the typos yourself. OK, it's correct. Not too many, but a few already. So. <laughs> So that's about uh, this evening discussion. Let's uh, uh, continue on our, uh, on, our, on our topics here. So last time we uh, discussed the uh, general uh, familiar uh, situations for the uh, scattering uh, processes. Okay. So of course, uh, uh, the most important uh, component that we want to focus on would be the scattering amplitudes. As you know, the scattering amplitudes are very important. Even some people these days are coming back to study the very broad general properties of a scattering amplitude. So that's what we discussed. So let's uh, uh, scattering So that's what we discussed. The first thing we discussed for scattering amplitude is a very important property. We call it unitarity. In fact, the example I, I gave you is uh, a simplest one. It's not the most general one. The, the one, more accurately, the one we discussed is called a partial wave unitarity. Because we expand the amplitude in, uh, into the different partial waves. And each partial wave satisfies this thing. It's very important. Mo most of the uh, estimates, including the dark matter mass and all these things, most of them come from this uh, partial wave amplitude. But that's not uh, the most general form. The most general form actually comes from the original uh, expression the scattering amplitude is unitary. So scattering amplitude unitary, so that's what uh, this uh, unitary bound actually would derive. I did not derive that. For I only give it the expansion and the C. You see, this is uh, not uh, going to extend one or something. I did not start in, so you, you even from the uh, either from the field theory or from uh, quantum mechanics, you may have seen some uh, kind of a der derivation from this. And this is basic requirement. This is a very basic requirement for our physical processes. I want to list the three. Uh, important properties for scattering amplitude, and this is the first one. Of course, the, the, the uh, application is the partial wave amplitude we derived, which is very, very important. That's why I want to show you, but uh, it's uh, only a simple uh, situation, not the most general form. Most general form is uh, scattering amplitude unitarity. So that's unitarity relation. This indicates the physical consequence. This is essentially some, uh, some conservation of some probability, uh, probability conservation. It doesn't go all, all, summing over all the possible channels and so on and so forth, so will not go infinity. Will be finite, will be one, normalized. So this is basically probability conservation. That's the physical consequence. The second uh, uh, important uh, uh, property is analyticity. The, this statement is a uh, scattering amplitude uh, as, a, as a function for energy in a complex plane should be uh, analytical, which basically means that we could allow only singularities for two kinds. Okay, uh, two kinds of singularities. One is uh, the simple poles, and one is branch cut. So the simple poles correspond to the situation discussed or, or, or already. The amplitude reach the uh, maximum. That's where the uh, resonance is, uh, is formed. Simple pole, you remember, it says one over some, some poles. Okay. The poles indicate where the energy uh, 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 p location, energy position, which is the mass. Energy position at a particular mass region, and then you, you develop the maximum amplitude. So this is the, the simple pole description. Mathematically, it's a, a scattering amplitude develops the simple poles. 
But physically, that is a resonance production. The other one is branch cut. You have a different sheath and the branch cut in between. That is a crossing for the uh, threshold. The threshold crossing. The threshold crossing basically is pair production. Just like uh, if you increase the, the energy, virtual photon energy, and higher and higher, suddenly you open a pair of new, fr new fermions, muon pair, tau pair, heavy quarks, so on and so forth. So that's when you cross this uh, threshold, you open a new, new, uh, new channel. So this is a branch cut. Branch cut is uh, the other uh, property of the analyticity uh, property. This is uh, the pair creation. So those are the physical correspondences. We have seen this, we, we learned this a lot. But this is the mathematical properties. So the mathem mathematical properties here so for, for the scattering amplitude, there was a third one. It's also uh, important about the symmetry. So symmetry here is about, we call it crossing symmetry. Okay. Crossing symmetry means that uh, if you have a fixed number of uh, particles in the I I reaction, like two to two, two particles in and two particles out, you could s switch the momentum in the different, different directions. In the sense that we, you switch the incoming particle to uh, outgoing, outgoing particle to I incoming, and uh, the amplitude should remain the same up to the uh, mathematical switching. Okay. And similarly, you can switch one, three particles in the final state, one heavy particle in the inner state to, to decay. And those uh, amplitude overall analytical properties should be the same up to the, the appropriate uh, switching sign for the momentum or something. So those uh, crossing symmetry basically means that the crossing channels, uh, different, the different uh, related different physical channels. So those are three, uh, three basic properties. In fact, uh, these three properties uh, were studied to great detail even before the field theory was developed. In fact, these, uh, these three properties are uh, physically important uh, properties even beyond field theory. String theory, anything others, and if you discuss the physical processes, those processes should be, those are uh, uh, the basic properties should be satisfied. So that's a very, 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 very important. So we only discussed this one. I want to mention to you that uh, there are uh, uh, important uh, other uh, uh, properties uh, are going there as well. Okay, so that's it for the general uh, description for the scattering processes and amplitude. Now let's get into the, uh, 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 the the small generalization. Let's generalize what we discussed uh, yesterday into the uh, relativistic formalism. So that's what we usually do in our field theory, right? We are dealing with high energies, nevertheless. So we have to get everything in the consistent way. Same principles and similar properties all there, but uh, just to make this uh, relativistic. Okay. So that is the next uh, section, uh, Lorentz environment amplitudes. Okay. So uh, without field theory derivations, I would just simply write them down. Okay. So Lorentz event the amplitude is once again given by the scattering matrix. So this is a, a matrix depending on the channels, depending on the interactions. The scattering matrix is defined to be the transition from inner state to final state, and this is the change. So this is a change we call it the transition uh, matrix matrix element. So this is the scattering matrix element. I, uh, I wrote down the uh, world function incoming and outgoing already. The, tra the, the change part is the transition part. They take, take out this uh, uh, unchanged uh, overall. So in that case, we can consider this matrix element to attach into the initial, uh, uh, initial states and uh, the well-defined final state. So that is uh, the matrix element given by the Betty channels. So this is the transition. Uh, matrix element. For example, I call that uh, initial state with uh, a particle A and particle B, state A and state B, and due to this uh, uh, interaction, due to this transition um, uh, element, and uh, reach to the final state. So this is the final state F. So we write this in terms of the Lorentz environment formalism. There's a, uh, the Fourier transformation factor for the four dimensional between the momentum space and uh, coordinate, and uh, there is a uh, 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 the, again, the overall factor due to the uh, Fourier transformation from one state to from one space to the other space, and that, that leads you to the momentum space statement. That momentum state, uh, space statement is uh, momentum conservation. 
four, uh, four components, which means energy and three vector components as well. So I call these uh, the A and B as the initial state uh, uh, particles minus the final state F. F could be multiple particles, the sum over all of these. So therefore, this is the uh, exponential factor, and then I gave you the, con the uh, energy, uh, the energy momentum conservation f in the full, co full uh, component sense. So this one is uh, each one of them is a full vector with energy component and the three spatial components there. Okay, so that's it. Then the amplitude here. This is what corresponding to our previous uh, scattering amplitude. So this is a. Uh, Amplitude for one particular uh, final state, the uh, uh, final state like this, and this M here, capital uh, kilographic M, is uh, the matrix element you calculate from your Feynman diagrams. So that's the normalization. So that and then you make the connection. So this is a Feynman diagram. This is Lorentz environment quantity. So uh, so uh, it's uh, frame independent. You can calculate in any free, uh, convenient uh, frame for your experiment, for your observation, for your uh, uh, convenience, whatever. And of course, independent of other choices, such as gauge and so on and so forth, gauge environment, all these uh, basic properties should be built in. So that's the formalism. And now let's get into the, uh, the specifics. Once again, this is the Feynman diagram calculations to any particular physical processes you are interested in, decay and production and so on and so forth. There. Let's look at uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the more useful ones. Let's look at uh, the two to two process. For two to two process, let's just specify a particle A and particle B in and particle one and particle two out. So that's, uh, that's uh, the, uh, the label, we, we do that, okay. So therefore, I give you the formalism and the uh, momentum variables for the two to two process and I will define these variables next and we can write these uh, variables in any form but most conveniently write, let's write them in the Lorentz, uh, uh, Lorentz environment form. So one is called uh, uh, the S channel, parameter S, T channel, parameter T, and uh, there are in fact uh, three of them I will show you uh, afterwards. And uh, three of them are not independent, they have a one uh, relation that only two are in independent for the two to two process. So then that, that is the expansion similar to what uh, we did in the non relativistic ex example. So this is a partial wave expansion. in terms of uh, the other quantum numbers. Here, J is a total angular momentum, summing over the, uh, all the contributing uh, components, in principle, to, to infinity. So here, J is a sum over the orbital angular momentum, L, that we use only, including spins. Because in a relativity quantum mechanics, spin is a necessary part of the wave functions. Like as you know, when you write down the Dirac equation, there's a spin index uh, in it, explicit. It can't be. So therefore, this is an uh, analog to our a sub l. Okay, but this is the generalized form of uh, our Legendre polynomial. It includes not only the uh, orbital angular momentum part but also the spin angular momentum part. The total quantum number is the total j. Total J, so that's the that's the conserved quantum number. That is a conserved quantum number for total J, rather than the individual ones. Okay. Then the mu here are the differences between the initial and finite final. So mu here is a helicity or the, the uh, spin difference from A between A and B. Mu prime is the spin difference between the one and a two. And M here, I sum over M. M is the maximum of the differences. So for more details, and, uh, the, this is called a Wigner D function. Okay, so if you uh, learned from a Sakurai, Sakurai's tech, uh, quantum mechanics book has a very uh, good description. And if you want to find a formalism, <coughs> the decomposition between the uh, harmonic oscillator function and the spin components, take a look at the PDG. PDG has a good list. It's, it's rather not very uh, uh, complete or not very pedagogical, but it has a reasonably good list. So I would not derive things, but the, you can see this is the correspondence to the 
uh, orbital uh, angular momentum uh, decomposition that we discussed uh, yesterday. So this is the final amplitude you can calculate, and then you can decompose that into this uh, depending on the particle spins as well. Okay. So that's uh, the general formula. So therefore, uh, similarly, you can reverse this process and uh, to uh, integrate over the angle to calculate the uh, partial wave amplitude. Where do I have to? Can I go beyond unitarity bound here? So can you all see? No. no you cannot, OK. No, no, because of the ah. OK. That's fine. Let me uh, continue that part on this board. OK. So I, I would hope to write this below that one. This is a partial wave amplitude for given quantum, uh, the uh, angular momentum quantum number as a function for energy, independent of angle. Angle is a scattering amplitude, but you project out these the different uh, partial waves already. And this is similar to what uh, uh, we, uh, we need there for the yesterday's expressions. So this is one, and you integrate over the angle. <coughs> then uh, you use these uh, Feynman diagram calculations, and then the particular uh, partial wave states and you check the, the, uh, the functional form explicit. But of course, the, the zero k equal, j equal to zero is the leading one. We usually call that l equal to zero. And uh, in that case, typically, this is the, the s wave, when l equal to one. And in particular, if the perturbation theory is uh, largely valid, and the first few partial waves typically dominant, in fact, most times, the, the leading partial wave dominance. So each one is uh, surprised by some factor. So this is how you, you calculate. Now once you know the Feynman diagram, you calculate the Feynman amplitude, you project out the, the partial waves. This is one of the homework problems. In fact, so that's one uh, I assign you to do. In fact, this is a very uh, intriguing uh, problem. Uh, uh, that problem, I, I did not ask you to derive this. As I said, I try to avoid technicality, only give you the, the concepts. I give you the amplitude. That amplitude is a WW scattering amplitude involving Higgs. I give you the amplitude to you already. You use something along this line, you can calculate the partial wave amplitude for this uh, WW scattering, and you find, so unitarity put a bound on that. And uh, I ask you to calculate what is the bound on the Higgs mass, similar to the dark matter mass. What is the bound if the Higgs mass is, is, is heavy? What is uh, the validity for this amplitude to be true, the energy regime? And in fact, I told you in the uh, appendix there saying that um, this actually was the uh, early, uh, in the 80s, the argument why the, uh, the SIC energy should be such and uh, why the LIC energy should be such. So they had a powerful argument there. So, so that's the way you, you, you carry on for, for these calculations. Okay? But uh, again, I would not derive individual diagrams for you, but I, as I mentioned to you, the field theory is not the part I want to discuss in this text, in these lectures. And even the standard model is not part I want to discuss in these uh, lectures. And I, I suppose you to be able to carry out some calculations yourself, if you're interested in. But in general, the uh, 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 amplitude, uh, the uh, partial wave amplitude, has certain uh, behavior in terms of uh, kinematics. So it is uh, typically proportional to the velocity or speed, the speed factor for the initial state and the orbital angular momentum, relative orbital angular momentum for that. Similarly, because the crossing, it is also a product of final state speed and uh, the relative orbital angular momentum for, for this one. And, and uh, the, the speed, of course, is our uh, well-known factor, one minus the, uh, the final state, or oh, okay, whatever, initial state or final state mass over the overall energy. So let's uh, we usually use s as squared. So that's the threshold. This is the, you, obviously this is the pair production, right? This is the uh, the threshold pair production. If the energy is available to produce two m squared, and then you produce, then this open. Otherwise, the velocity is not going to go. So, but. Uh, Near the threshold, when you just barely produce the pair, and this velocity is rather small. Again, this velocity in units of c, right? One is the speed of light. When the very ultra-relativistic energy is so much bigger than the mass, this is the gone. Then this is uh, speed of light, one. If this is nearly close to the threshold of production, and this is a close to one, and this uh, the speed or velocity, the, the pair, it's very, uh, very, uh, very small. This corresponds to some production and the final state of particle one going out 
final state particle two is going out. If this one and two are same mass, this will be the same. Otherwise, there's a modification. So this is the velocity for each particle moving. So that's called the threshold uh, behavior. So this goes like this. So you can check you, you, any particular uh, uh, process you are interested in. You can check the, this uh, gen general behavior. And the other behavior is cross-section is uh, proportion to the square of these. So therefore, for one thing, initial state typically are light. Particles, uh, E plus minus, uh, Q, Q bar, and even proton, proton is typically light. The final state particles are what I, we are interested in. We want to produce new, uh, new particles, new heavy particles. So it is uh, proportional to the final state, velocity squared, amplitude squared, and plus uh, uh, the uh, kinematical, uh, kinematical factor from phase space that I will derive next. Okay. So that is a typical, uh, typical behavior. Near threshold, this factor is, uh, is very relevant. Far above threshold, this factor is irrelevant. It's one. Far above threshold, it beta is one. Speed of light. Everything is speed of light. Everything is essentially mass is floating around. Near threshold, this is, uh, this is very relevant. So for example, for the S wave, for the S wave, which means that there is a relative uh, angular momentum. Uh, sorry, there's uh, no relative angular momentum, uh, 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 orbital angular momentum, L equal to zero. So that is L equal to zero. That uh, is proportional to beta linear. Okay. Now, if you go to a higher partial wave, P wave, P wave is uh, one uh, uh, orbital orbital angular momentum equal to one, and that behavior is beta cubic. Beta cubic, of course, is uh, the threshold uh, three halves, right? The, the threshold three halves. This is the root here. So this is a very important uh, consequence for angular momentum conservation, and uh, this the behavior has been observed, has been used for many important discoveries, including the identif identification of quarks. You produce the uh, new heavy quarks threshold, and then whether the production cross section, the production cross section, if you do this uh, versus energy. Uh, you, you scan, you scan at the different energies. You scan at the different energies. And once you cross this uh, threshold, you open up, you produce a particle pair in pair. Below that, you, do, you cannot. So uh, off shell, this doesn't go. Once you produce it, it goes like this, the cross section goes like this. This is a very fast growing. In the beginning, it's almost linear here. And this is the L equal to zero partial wave. And then instead, if you produce the pair with a relative uh, orbital angular momentum, it goes at a cubic. It goes very slow. So just by scanning this uh, seed cross section, change, and you can uh, fit whether the final state particles without measuring anything. Just look at the cross section. You can see whether this is a spin half to give you the correct um, uh, crack the uh, partial wave, S wave, or P wave already. And this has been uh, uh, used as important uh, information confirmation for uh, quark pair production. Okay. So, so this is the, the uh, general behavior for the amplitude and the contribution to the cross section. OK, so now let's uh, uh, comment on some of the uh, cross section formulas mm -hmm. using our uh, amplitude. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's look at the, the formulas and then uh, Define the uh, the events, define the events rate, and then move on to some uh, details. Okay, transition rate. Once again, it follows some similar formula like uh, the Fermi's golden rules. But um, now let's use our uh, relativistic formalism. The first one is about the decay. Decay is nothing but a, a slightly different kinematics with one particle in the initial state. Decay rate is the one particle go to final state. Let's say it's the n of them in the final state, two, three, and more of them like, like this. So decay rate here is given by this uh, formalism. So here, let's call it a partial width. Partial width means uh, uh, one particular channel. But uh, there may be many, many channels. You sum over all many, many channels, and uh, you get the so-called total width. So this is the one plus um, as many particles as are relevant. And that's given by the framework at the, at the particle rest. 
But uh, the particle moving is simple Lorentz transformation is rather easy, right? Gamma factor. So for the decay, the relevant one uh, is always the, uh, the rest of frame calculation. So that's why this uh, energy factor is simply mass factor. Okay? And then you uh, have the squared matrix element. This is the M, same M that uh, you are, you are. I make this M slightly nicer looking. Is that nicer looking? <laughs> this one like that, so this is a calligraphic. Uh, I'm not very calligraphic, but this is a calligraphic M. But usually we have a notation to say, from its golden rule in quantum mechanics, the first time to tell you that uh, you have to sum over all degenerate quantum numbers. And the identical particles, like the quantum internal quantum numbers, like a color, sometimes you cannot directly measure spins. You have to sum over spin. You need to sum over all these uh, degenerate quantum numbers. But this bar means we average from initial state. We don't know the particular specification in state. Any possible contributing initial state need to be summed over and averaged out for one. So this sigma bar is traditional expression that we always use to indicate sum over all degenerate uh, uh, quantum numbers and average over the initial state uh, quantum numbers out. So that's the notation here. And then you want to see the phase space available. Lorentz environment phase space uh, elements, that we'll discuss this quite a lot, because there's a lot of uh, interesting f physics in it. In fact, uh, this is one of the main themes for the lectures. I usually call this uh, theme from kinematics to dynamics. So this, uh, the phase space kinematics can lead you to think, can teach you how to think about uh, the underlying dynamics that we are looking for. At the bottom line, the, the, uh, as much detailed techn technicality I have gone through towards the end, the whole point we are trying to do is in the, in the collider environment, how we can be prepared, how we can design, how we can look for new physics. So that's the whole point uh, for, the, for the lectures. But I, I won't say this too much because I don't play with the particular model. I don't play with the particular SUSI or something. But all these discussions are aimed to see how we can understand this, uh, the structure and how to design things and to, to search for new physics. So that is uh, the hidden uh, information that I want to, to tell you. So here is the general formalism. Phase space, kinematics, m squared, dynamics. That's where the, all the interactions, models, particles, and all the things are uh, hidden. Okay. So that's uh, the model dependent part. I would, I would do very little about this. Of course, I have to give you examples. We have to get involved with the top quark, Higgs, and so on and so forth. But here is a universal. Here is a model independent general treatment. Here is a dynamics. So that's a decay rate. But I, as I said, I call this partial width. The partial width is one channel for one to, uh, let's say this, uh, one to n. And you may have a three particle, four particles, and so on and so forth. Each one of them is one uh, calculation, but the total partial width, total width is a sum over all the contributing partial waves. This is similar to the uh, circuits in, uh, in parallel. Each parallel uh, circuit would take away certain branching, certain, uh, certain current. Okay. So the branching fraction, usually we use this a lot, is the branching to go to one particular one. The branching fraction uh, associated with that, for this one particular, uh, let's use one of the Fs, is that particular partial width calculated <coughs> by this and divided by the total how much you have. So this is gamma total width. So that's what uh, we, we, we really do. But these are all possible channels. And all the possible channels will tell you how fast this per particle, uh, this particle would decay. How fast measures what, by what? By lifetime. So lifetime is defined <coughs> by the reverse. The inverse of the total. The more channels to go, the larger the total width is, the shorter leave this particle will be. So that's it. Yes? Yeah, so is it in, in infinitesimal, this uh, decay rate? Because you have this, uh, this phase space like with a D. You know what I mean? Yeah, where you have like the infinite variant phase space there. Yeah, okay. this one. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, uh, in my homeworks and, and also solutions, I have been uh, sloppy in this sense. I integrate out 
uh, as many variables as, uh, as I want <coughs> without putting in the integration sign. So, the in the, uh, so that's what I, uh, in fact, I always do. Uh, in my natural nodes, I never have this D. I basically have this one, and this seem to be uh, three, I would define this, uh, multi-dimension, three n dimension, three n dimension or something. But uh, if I said this angle the trivial, I would just integrate out two pi. That angle tri trivial, I would integrate out. Uh, the, so, so that in that in terms of notation, I'm, I'm, I'm sloppy. But you have understand. You won't be confused. You you once you know my convention, you won't be confused. Yes, this is the phase space element, which basically means almost like a particular solid angle. But uh, the total width, of course, is integ integral. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I would not, in the future, I would not put this, but you are right. I mean, uh, total width is integration over the available phase space. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for pointing out. Yeah. So someone is following. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is the first ex uh, uh, example. Second example, only two, these two examples are very uh, relevant. The second one is a scattering process. Yeah. The second the scattering process is the initial two particles to interact into the final state particles. Therefore, the phase space, in principle, is, that, is that identically the same. The phase space will be the same. So this process is a sigma cross-section with the particle A and B coming in, and particle 1, 2, 3, and N out. So that one has a similar formalism. 1 over the center mass energy uh, squared and, and the dynamics. This is uh, the, the uh, Farman amplitude M. And the phase space N body element or integrate total cross section once again refers to the integration over all available phase space. So that's the, uh, the formalism. <coughs> so let's see uh, what this uh, tells us. So the Phase space is again a Lorentz invariant formalism for a fact for a factor imposed uh, energy momentum conservation inertial state. This is some one particle or two. And that's a sum over all final state particles, and times the the each element. Each element is a phase space three two pi factor, and d p three momentum three momentum over the energy uh, particular energy correspond to that particle. And this uh, product is uh, each element. Each particle has contributed one uh, available. Uh, element. All these particles share the overall available phase space. And here is sum or a product from I equal to for the particle to N. So this is a Lorentz invariant N body final state uh, phase space factor element. Okay. So uh, I give you another very simple homework assignment. Ask you to show this element here is good, is the correct combination to be Lorentz invariant. <laughs> So momentum P itself is not. Two things we learn from here. One is uh, uh, relativistic, uh, one is quantum mechanical, in fact. So it's both uh, in it. Relativistic means that uh, this uh, dP here <coughs> is not Lorentz invariant. If you describe this uh, process a different frame, it changes. That's not correct the description. Uh, you have to keep track of this, so it's, it's impossible. So that is the correct one. In contrast to the classical phase space, in your thermal, thermal, not thermal, statistical mechanic, in your th in your, uh, stomach, what is phase space? You remember what this phase space factor we usually do? We have the velocity cubic. That's it, no division, right? And we even have the coordinate. That's what the, each particle will make it a phase space. So the reason the phase space here is different is the relative is quantum mechanical. We don't have the position. We have uh, waves that are floating, floating around. Phase space specification. This is the best you can do. You cannot specify <coughs> the position. It's not the, all the uh, will packets. Will packet classical limit you can do. Typically, you don't. Phase space does not have the coordinate components. You could do either way. 
But the other way will have to. It's not uh, our experimental setting. Our ex experimental setting is always well defined uh, initial uh, particle with a well defined energy or momentum. That's you, you set it up. So typically it's a pl plane wave. So this is a correct way to, to describe this. Relativistic, the ratio. Quantum mechanical, only one. Only one factor. So that's the, the difference from classical uh, phase space. So that's all we deal with. Not, not this. Okay. This is a classical uh, stomach. All right, so uh, finally, final remark about uh, uh, what is this uh, useful for. We compare with observation, with experiments. The observation and experiments will be the, the measurement of the number of events. Okay, We measure the events, we count events in particular phase space region, solid angle or energy regime and uh, momentum regime and so on and so forth. So that is uh, event rate. as a function of energy. So typically you would say, yeah, we uh, encounter this. Uh, if you know the scattering cross-section and how big the cross-section is, how likely the, the reaction happens, the, the cross-section. And this is a, a centimeter squared. Of course, it's a GeV squared inverse. Right? I told, told you, when you calculate everything here, you always end up having GeVs, GeV squares. You always you end up having GeV squared. Then you convert that using the, the <coughs> natural units I gave you yesterday. So that's how you, you convert it. So you always have, end up having this one. This is a uh, centimeter squared. Then you multiply this by the, uh, the flux. The flux is luminosity. The flux is the number of events per centimeter squared per second. So therefore, you see how big the, cro the cross-section is. You multiply it together, it gives you a number of events per second. So that's the, the number of events per second. Quite common, this is the useful. This is most, probably the most useful the formula you use, estimate the events all the time. However, this is not very, uh, it's not always applicable. Uh, uh, in, many certain, uh, in many circumstances, this would not need to be modified. I will discuss this situation with you. The reason is that this luminosity. This luminosity seems to be a number. And uh, in fact, the luminosity is from this, uh, the picture I draw for you that uh, you have a bunches and that the particle come in. The, the particle is not always a monochromatic, right? If up to your, experim your experimental condition, how well you can tune this particle energy? In fact, so far typically percentage, sometimes a sub percent, 10 to minus 3. Typ most of the time for E plus minus machine, they do re really well, typically around 10 to minus 3 level. But it's still 10 to minus 3. You have a, a energy spectrum for the, for the flux. The flux typically is always is always uh, is always kind of a, a integration over uh, the flux. What is the best way to say that? Um, the flux is always a normalized one, and uh, the energy. There's energy distribution. So typically, there's energy distribution, so a, a spectrum. Good ones, it's the Gaussian. Good one, that you, you set up the beam, it's kind of Gaussian distribution. Gaussian distribution, if the Gaussian distribution, uh, uh, the resolution is very, very good, very narrow, it's uh, approximately delta function. And this is the only true for the delta function approximation. The delta function approximation is a monochromatic. Monochromatic means perfect energy resolution. I have a fixed energy, fixed momentum. Then, of course, that is total number is rare to, to deliver at a particular value. That's it. But in fact, this one has some profile. This is uh, energy E. And there's a profile. The narrower you can make this, the better quality your beam is. But it's not uh, always possible. I will give you examples, uh, physical examples in the history. And uh, we use this and, uh, for different uh, uh, circumstances, different uh, uh, physics outcome as, as well. So that's a typical the situation. This is a quite common number you use. Uh, they say, ah, oh, the LIC energy has been uh, integrated over. Uh, now it's about 100 inverse, uh, 100 inverse of the uh, functor bond now. That's the number you put in, multiply your cross-section. And that is a situation that you think you deliver the energy into the luminosity into the region that you fully contributed to your cross-section there. Okay. So that's an easy estimate. In reality, if you want to have uh, more details, and this, you always need to convolute this. So I will give you examples for that. I will also assign homework 
for you to play and to understand it a little better. So that's what I want to discuss with you yesterday. So these are two pages of missing <coughs> yesterday I did not get a chance to, to do. Now let's continue on the, the, the details. So next, uh, uh, today's lecture, I, I was hoping to finish. I doubt I can completely uh, get this done, but I will go as far as I can. Why is want to have a full treatment to understand what this, uh, uh, the kinematics would do for us? main features and derive uh, certain things. And then we, uh, uh, to the end, we discuss the, uh, the uh, detectors, how we really observe, how do we see uh, the different particles. So you will find uh, it's interesting and, and, and kind of, uh, uh, to, some of, to some of us, it's kind of surprising as well. Okay. So that is about uh, the uh, chapter one and the two. Now let's move on to chapter three, kinematics. All right, let's start from simplest. One element, only one particle in the final state. <coughs> okay, so that is uh, the overall definition. This is the overall definition of the Lorentz invariant uh, phase space element. People, have, some people have a different normalization, but the, I think this is the most convenient. Some people pull this out all together, have all the pies, but I think this is a reasonable. Each each particle actually has this three dimensional Fourier transformation. This, I, I like this normalization best anyway. So this is my definition of the. It's uh, even slightly different from particle data PDG, but I think this is the. It's easier for me to keep track. So that's uh, my definition of the uh, element. So let's look at uh, uh, each one at, a, at one time. Let's, uh, first of all, let's uh, study the one particle. Of course, one particle is the base for everything else, right? One particle final state. So uh, you can consider this is almost like a scattering process, a two uh, merge into one. So that's um, uh, the uh, example. So then you do this uh, definition. And A equal to 1. <coughs> A equal to 1, there's only one element. Of course, uh, the delta function is, uh, is still imposed. Then in the beginning, you have a 2 pi to the fourth. Then you cancel out with a 2 pi, 1 power, one power only upstairs. And then uh, you have this uh, delta function. P, capital P, is a sum over A and B minus final state sum is only 1. So therefore, the sum of these will have to form this is imposed by the energy momentum conservation. So that's the, the and finally one particle phase space element momentum only. It's called if you use one, you use one. This is the energy component. This is uh, the uh, spatial momentum uh, components. So that's uh, the one particle uh, phase space. Okay. So there are two possible expressions to go uh, further depending on uh, your physical process you are interested in. But of course, this is the uh, uh, XYZ coordinate, like a uh, Cartesian coordinate. You can write this into polar. You can write this into polar uh, uh, component. And then there's a magnitude, almost like R squared, dr, and d cosine d phi. Sorry, the angle. So just to change it to polar, you can do that. If you change this uh, to polar, and you can combine this one to say that, uh, in fact, this is the same as the energy component. Because relativistically, it's uh, E squared equal to P squared minus uh, 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 plus M. You take the derivative. Uh, so this is uh, always it's a linear relation between the momentum and the energy momentum. So therefore, you substitute this one, you cancel this one out. So the, f the first expression. The first expression using this kind of polar uh, expression would be pi one magnitude left and um, the uh, solid angle, two angles, d cosine theta, we call that the polar angle, and the phi is azimuth angle. Polar angle, usually cosine theta is from minus one to plus one, and polar angle, of course, sorry, the azimuth angle is from zero to two pi, or from minus pi to pi, it's up to your convention. That's one. And you integrate out one energy component. Then uh, the leftover is a three component. That this is the capital P, big one, this one. 
So this imposes the that that condition. So this first one. <coughs> but second, the second expression is that I hope to integrate out the spatial moment, the spatial uh, spatial variables rather than the uh, time like uh, the energy variables. And there's a tr there's a trivial uh, identity. The trivial identity is this um, expression can be written as a uh, integration. Uh, let me write this a uh, little bit. Uh, um, that's okay. I think I write here. So there's a trivial identity that can be written as an integration over a uh, integration over a uh, four momentum and uh, one dimensional delta function. So you integrate out this uh, one dimensional delta function, you, you are left with a three. Of course, this delta, delta function immediately gave you something like a one over two e and uh, you use for it. So that's uh, how you, you, you get it. So that's a trivial uh, identity. Using this uh, trivial identity, you integrate out these four component with this uh, uh, delta functions. So therefore, you are left with a two pi delta s minus this one. So either so there, this one particle phase space can be expressed either by integrating out the energy component with the three components left, or integrate o over the three uh, co <laughs> component with the one uh, left. There are, uh, you cannot get rid of the, the all data functions because these the four constraints and the three variables. So this is the overly constrained system. One particle production is overly constrained system. The initial state will have to satisfy this energy uh, momentum relation to produce. Is particle. Otherwise, you are off the kinematic relation. So that is uh, the uh, the lesson you learned. So it's overly con con uh, constrained system, and from this you see either this relation, either uh, in fact both either or either or seem to be uh, not correct. Either I don't say either and right. Uh, uh, we have uh, both the initial state A and B equal to the uh, that's from the first one and not or and uh, the center mass energy for this uh, initial state system have to match the final state on mass shell production this is the single particle production so this is the, the kinematic relations. Okay, the, 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 the are the constraints. Okay, the final remark is that uh, you can see this is a dimension. This oh, I missed something. Yeah, I missed uh, some remarks. Let me put the remarks here. This is a, that's a important general properties. The general properties uh, should be here. Dimensionality. Dimensionality for these uh, uh, the cross sections there. So the dynamics okay, like dimensionality for 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 scattering process. The decay process is similar but uh, less interesting. So dimensionality, we can look at these. The total uh, dimensionality for the cross section is always one over GeV squared centimeter squared, and therefore this factor overall, no matter how many particles you are producing, is dimensionless. So the product of this uh, dynamics and phase space is dimensionless because this takes care of the uh, the dimensionality already. Okay, so there, so those two guys, uh, um, uh, the dynamics here, therefore, and uh, you have a, uh, uh, let's uh, each, okay, let's, let's see the uh, phase space. Phase space is easier. Dimensionality for the phase space, each particle contributed to three minus one. So each particle can be the two. Yeah. I think there's a typo. It's one over two s squared. No. no. 
S is uh, energy squared. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, uh, mass is energy. <laughs> S is energy uh, squared. Root S is center mass energy. Okay, so this is the this is the GeV squared. Okay. Which one? This one? No, 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 no. This has a different uh, dimensionality. This one has a GeV. Decay wave is GeV. And decay uh, lifetime is inverse GeV. Tau is 1 over GeV. Width is GeV measured. It's dimension 4. Sorry. This is the GeV units. This is the inverse GeV squared. This is cross section. And this is the per second. Sorry, I should have made this clear. Okay, okay. So <coughs> then each particle contributed to three minus one, and then minus a constraint. So this is the phase space dimensionality. Okay, for uh, arbitrary number of particle finite states. Okay, so uh, this one therefore is dimensionless. That is a four minus two n. The dynamics. Each, each particle. Okay. Now let's look at uh, the uh, uh, the kinematic for for one example. <coughs> for two particle final state two to two, and this uh, kinematics phase space factor is zero. Dimensionless. This is quite a common uh, behavior, you should remember. For two body uh, final state, it's quite common. Most of the time, we study two, two particles. Now, not very much at the LIC anymore because of energy. Before LIC, the multiple particle production is not that common yet. That's why all these calculation techniques are developed, because uh, we need to get into the multiple particle production already. But before, the two particles is very leading. So for the two particle production, the two body phase space is dimensionless. Therefore, the two particle dynamics, matrix element squared, is also dimensionless. Okay, remember that I think uh, Ruben probably asked one of you for the dimensionality. So follow this all come from this uh, kind of uh, general uh, properties. So n equals three, three body phase space is, uh, is uh, higher dimensional. Three in the, this is two dimensional. So that's a, a um, two dimensional for the phase space, and therefore the uh, uh, the matrix element is. Uh, uh, Inverse because the product is, uh, is there. Okay, so that's what I want to to summarize the gener general uh, behavior. You should you should remember. Now come back to the one we were we were talking about there. One particle, one particle. What is the dimensionality? That's why you see that already. It's the energy inverse, energy squared inverse. One particle is minus two dimensionality. So that phase space here we integrate out is dimensionality uh, 1 over energy squared. In order to, so uh, sometimes you want to compare with available phase space. I would, uh, I would define a so-called phase space uh, volume available for these uh, n-body particles. More particles in a state, they squeeze each other, they share each other, so available phase space is less for more and more particles. So let's uh, have a dimensionless using S to change the dimensionless. So therefore, the dimensionless quantity I call that a phase space volume. That is uh, multiplied by s to make the dimensionless. And the p s one particle, that's a simply a 2 pi. That is the uh, largest available phase space in my uh, convention. One particle only. Everything is available to this single particle, the 2 pi uh, volume. Okay, remember this. Uh, we will come back to this point. So that's the available phase space. So you usually say phase space suppression. The phase space suppression one is the, the mass suppression. The other is the more particle to share, there's a phase space suppression. That was uh, the one I want to come back to, to, to tell you. Okay. We discussed the decay, uh, decay rate here. So the decay here tells you the particle is unstable because the, the, the particle will split into the many, many different possible channels. It's an unstable particle. Once it has a non-zero width, it will be a non-zero life, uh, non lifetime. It goes. 
So we know, once again, the same quantum mechanical description, there's the exponential decay. So that's quite common, right, exponential decay. Let's see, uh, following this uh, argument here, let's look at uh, the, um, uh, <coughs> the exponential decay here. So in quantum mechanics, we know that uh, uh, the particle uh, probability or number of particles exponentially decay according to some, some lifetime. Of course, this lifetime is, uh, uh, is one over width. So you could say this is, a, a, this is a, the number already. If you use a wave function description, and, uh, typically if you use a wave function, it's, uh, it's like uh, wave function 0, <coughs> e minus t minus gamma t over 2. Because you square that, give you probability. So it's just along these lines. So you, you see this uh, in the quantum mechanics description already. So this, uh, th this is total width to sum over many, many uh, branches, many uh, channels, branchings. Okay. <coughs> but I mentioned to you, if you do the Fourier transformation for this, that leads you to the, uh, the, ma the largest partial wave amplitude. And that's where the resonance happens. And, uh, and uh, Brad Wigner <coughs> formulated <laughs> the approximation that was answers it was not real real derivation, but answers is that uh, as a function of energy, if you hit some particular energy value, then that hits maximum. But since this is not a, a divergent, you need to regularize this by some small quantity, and this uh, tells you the resonant rate. So that's the the width. In the relativistic situation, we have to make this uh, square. So that is uh, um, it's a uh, Lorentz invariant. So therefore, this is uh, the uh, Brad Wigner resonance. Sometimes called the Brad Wigner resonance. You square that, you have the energy square, the mass square. Um, let's leave it out. This. <coughs> This is basically propagator squared, your, your particle propagator squared. So this is the how uh, the uh, Bragg-Wigner resonance is. So therefore, in your uh, uh, phase space treatment, it c you encounter this uh, all the time. <coughs> Even for that the single particle production, we assume the particle is produced on mass shell. We're thinking that's a stable. But it's stable only if momentarily. Okay. The, the momentary uh, a stable situation is measured by the by the width. Okay, so in our in our situation, we mean that uh, this width is rather narrow, so that this particle on mass shell is well defined. Narrow basically means that uh, at a particular location, the mass location, then this is rather narrow resonance. Therefore, you can you can define a mass. The narrower this width is, the more stable and uh, better defined. So uh, if the width is uh, essentially zero, and the lifetime is long-lived, and this particle is propagating in your field theory on the on-particle on shell, uh, on shell particle production, such as our electron or proton. Absolutely long-lived so far. No evidence for them to split, to decay, to anything yet. So that's the uh, infinite lifetime, zero width, and it's a delta function. But uh, for most of the other particles we know, they are artificially produced, they would split, and decay, and then it's measured by the, by the width. And this is the correct description, but this narrow width is the approximation. That is typically called the narrow width approximation. In fact, numerically, it's about 10% less than 20, 10% less than 20% of this ratio. And numerically, it's a good approximation. We, we deal with that multiple times. Even Z. C is 100 GeV mass, 190 GeV mass, 2.45 GeV um, in width, percentage, uh, percentage narrow, very narrow width. OK, so that's what we do. In this limit, so we take this, uh, uh, the, re uh, the resonance distribution, is, it behaves like this. It looks like delta function. In fact, delta function has many different representations, you remember, right? Many mathematical uh, uh, representations, this is one of them. So this leads you to gamma mass pi, uh, some kind of uh, off-shell 
virtual mass minus mass. This is narrow wave approximation. Narrow wave approximation can simply replace the, the bright Wigner form by delta function, makes things much easier. So you immediately integrate out, and the uh, unshell particle you produce and let it go forever. But it's only under, under approximation. Most times it's okay. How to quantify this? I will go to, into that from observation. This is observational related. You, obs you see that or not? It's observation related. This is critically important for the for detector. I will tell you. <laughs> so that's what we want to go towards the end of the lecture. Okay, so that's one particle uh, production there. And let's move on to a two particle final state. The two particle final state is uh, probably most uh, common, most uh, common uh, uh, practice you encounter. And we want to go through the details as well. But uh, in terms of the phase state derivation, for that a few steps, I may have to skip. It's something similar to that. You just replace it by the identity and so on and so forth, and you arrive at the result you want to see. But uh, it's uh, relatively straightforward. Two-body phase space, of course. Then you cancel out this uh, uh, 2 pi to the 6, and cancel out by 2 pi to the 4th. And this is what you have. Four dimensional delta function to begin with. The final, uh, the initial state A and B minus final state 1 and 2. So that is uh, my notation. Initial state is always A and B to begin with. Final state are uh, two particles now. Then you have two elements. Three dimensional Lorentz environment. Three dimensional Lorentz environment. So that's the formalism. But uh, it's a six dimensional integration and uh, with four constraints, it's not very uh, practical. So let's work out uh, the details. So, first of all, you can replace this one by the, the polar angle, polar system that we, we derive there. Okay? You, once you uh, replace that one by, uh, by that one, you can. Uh, let me see which one that uh, works. Then you have this uh, the first integration uh, out there. So you have uh, the um, it's a it's a dimensionless, and uh, it becomes the first center mass frame the momentum over the center mass energy. And the four-dimensional delta function uh, can be integrated out if you use the, this uh, the four-dimensional uh, the delta function integration uh, that one there the second uh, expression there you integrate out this uh, four-dimensional so you have this uh, this one here <coughs> so basically what I was doing here is to use the uh, second one this is the this, the second uh, expression I give you. Then this is the one you use this uh, <coughs> the first one. So first one using the first expression, second one the second expression. You integrate out uh, the Dirna function, and you have a one uh, leap there left there, and you integrate over this one it uh, cancels out. So that's uh, one of the uh, one of the e e expressions here. Of course, this is the polar angle. And the azimuthal angle, let's call it one. So, so that's the the, uh, the expression. Okay. <coughs> so we can we can learn something here already. This is dimensionless. Dimensionless uh, means there's no uh, energy integration variable. Therefore, energy and momentum is fixed. So that is even known for classical mechanics, right? So elastic scattering, two particles coming in, two particles, uh, uh, the energy momentum is fixed. There's no variable. Yeah. It's not overly constrained. It's exactly cancelled out. For integration, for the function, it's just a perfectly integrated out, and uh, there's no uh, no other uh, <coughs> available things. So therefore, the magnitude in the center mass frame, particle one, is equal to the magnitude for the uh, center mass frame uh, for particle two, that is fixed by a quantity, but this quantity is conveniently given by this uh, invariant function. So I call it, we call that a, a lambda. 
it's a function of the three available uh, energy scales. So this is the kinematical factor lambda. How many of you have used this kinematical factor lambda? Quite a few of you, it's half, almost half of them, more, more than half of them. You know this is a very convenient uh, environment quantity called the kinematical factor lambda. It's defined by the symmetric function. Three variables involving three energy scales, x, y, and z, is symmetric by any rotation among them. And uh, uh, minus, sorry, it's uh, minus four y z is equal to x square uh, y square z square minus two x y minus two x z minus two y z. So that's uh, the symmetric function. So these three quantities uh, are here, in fact. Of course, uh, <laughs> if uh, m one and m two are equal, that reduce to beta. That's uh, the velocity function. So this is a more general form. Uh, for the finite state particles, if uh, uh, the particle one, particle two are uh, non-equal masses, so this is most general form, form, f formulas. So you can see this uh, the, this uh, momentum uh, is uh, fixed, and so its energy is fixed. The energy is also fixed as a uh, uh, one central mass energy is central mass energy for one plus minus central mass energy for particle two is s. They are not equal. The heavier particle carries more energy. But the momentum is the same. The momentum is conserved in the center mass. Is, uh, momentum is balanced at the center mass frame. Center mass frame means I sit here, the two particles moving out with, a, uh, with the same magnitude mo mo momentum and uh, with opposite signs to momentum. But the heavier one, of course, has additional mass into it and it carries more energy. So that uh, reflects by the sign. One is add up. Two is add up, the other one is a subtract. So that's a, if you sum these two, that's equal to uh, S. Sum energy one and the two is, is con confined by this. So that is a two-body uh, two kinematics. Now let's uh, look at uh, the so-called uh, phase space factor, uh, space speed volume. How much phase space available for two particles to share? It is dimensionless already. So it dimensionless already, this is it. In order to estimate uh, the, uh, the um, volume, let's rescale all these energies so that we can scale into a dimensionless integration variables. So we integrate the over these two. <coughs> let's call this uh, one as a uh, integration from zero to one. This, is from, this integration is from minus one to one, right? This, that's the integration from zero to one. And then therefore you pull out a Jacobian. Jacobian is a two. So similarly, you integrate over this from zero to two pi, that's a full phase space. And let's uh, do Jacobian. One. So the integrate, uh, so this, uh, the f uh, phase space volume here is pulled out the Jacobians. And that integration for this, uh, two-body phase space is one over four pi, pull out the Jacobians, one half, and lambda, one half, dimensionless, dimensionless, and uh, integration with the volume one. This is the volume is one. In fact, the reason to do that is a, is a, is a twofold. One is I want to see the available phase space I want to show you. Secondly, this is the way we usually generate our Monte Carlo. I will comment on Monte Carlo very briefly. I will not discuss Monte Carlo very much. When you do Monte Carlo, you always want to, uh, to uh, pull out the Jacobian and then generate the random numbers more in the most convenient way. The random numbers more generally, most convenient generated from zero to one. So this is how, this is expression. When we want to use Monte Carlo technique to evaluate the phase space integration, that's how we, we start. The, all the Jacobians are pulled out already. So therefore, this is, uh, uh, in the limiting case, this is basically one. So this is, be this is beta. In the, in the high energy case, okay, that is one. Available phase space for not to the mass suppression is, is totally uh, given by this. So therefore, the phase space for two body and the phase space for, for one body this is dimensionless, this is dimensionless. It is uh, eight, 8 pi divided by 2 pi.
This looks very familiar. Does this look familiar? The phase space suppression, the phase space suppression for one particle is one over four pi squared. Does that look uh, familiar? This is exactly the same as what you do. One particle, you do the cutting, cutting. That is equivalent to the additional virtual particle integration. That's very similar to the virtual particle integration. The additional particle in the final state is equivalent in terms of phase space suppression, is equivalent to one loop calculation. So this is one loop factor. So each additional particle phase space suppression is equivalent to one additional one loop uh, integration. So that's where it's, it, it's from. So if you continue on, I will give you one example. You continue on, it's always, it, uh, it always works, maybe up to a small factor or something. It always works for the, the three dimensions and so on and so forth. Additional particle tossing into your system, you have a phase space sharing, phase space suppression. That suppression is four pi squared, same as the additional one loop phase space suppression factor. So that's the, um, <coughs> the phase space. OK, so uh, I quickly write down one more expression that I would not derive. And this is uh, useful for uh, practical calculations and also to uh, help you somewhat for your uh, uh, homework. Let's look at uh, the, uh, co uh, the covariant variables. Invariant variables, actually. I mentioned to you that we use S and T. The S we gave you already is uh, uh, particle 1 plus particle B squared. And that is also uh, given in terms of the uh, total central mass energy squared. That one we use all the time. But uh, in fact, the 2 to 2 process has uh, two more variables. In, in fact, it's uh, only one uh, independent. Let's consider this uh, uh, particle A in. In particle B in, in particle one out, particle two out. That's our uh, two to two process due to some whatever interactions here. Then the possible kinematics is not only the sum, that is a, a relatively trivial. The energy momentum conservation tells you they must be equal. And that gives you the central mass energy squared. So that's the first one we have been using all the time. However, there's angular, non-trivial angular behavior. This is a scattering angle for the particle one coming out. So therefore, we need to introduce the energy, the energy momentum transfer. The transfer is from the particle one A to particle uh, one out, A and one. Effectively, this is almost like this, Al almost like this. So sometimes we call that Q, but never mind. Almost like Q squared. This is the momentum transfer. So it's uh, in it, the, the initial state minus the final state, and then the squared. So that yeah. is the other variable we call that T. Of course, by momentum conservation, you can write this second expression. It's connected to B and the 2. When you square that, it's a sign is uh, not relevant. Then you can express this by the uh, mass squared and and the uh, energy and the uh, magnitude of the momentum and the relative angle. So therefore, this T is a variable, even given the energy. It is a variable depending on the scattering angle. The T actually describes the scattering angle, momentum transfer is different scattering angle. But of course, you can look at it from the other side. Other side is uh, from other momentum transfer, we call that U. U is from uh, particle A coming in here and scattering out by particle uh, 2. This is called the U channel. This is the T channel, and this is the, if the exchange uh, happens like this. And we call that the T, T channel. So this is exchange for this one. Of course, B minus P1 squared. And then you can write down the similar expression that the similar expression will be A2 minus 2 A and magnitude and the cosine angle between A and 2. But a and two, the angles are different by pi, right? So this, uh, this is the, that angle. This is the uh, 
that angle. So that you can uh, you can change this uh, to a uh, to a s opposite sign there. If you sum over these the three quantities, it turns out the t and u are related because of the uh, the angle e equivalence because of that relation I mentioned to you. So you sum over these, the angles, two angles uh, cancel out. So the STU sum is equal to the sum over all particle mass, full mar particle mass involved. And then there's an there's a identity. There's no angular dependence anymore. So therefore, an ST and U three parameters have only two independent uh, variables. Typically, S is always used for the uh, input entity, and T is used for the uh, uh, scattering angle. And once you know T, U is known. So that's a, that's a two-body kinematic relation. So you can write this uh, 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 integration, phase phase integration in terms of this uh, angle, uh, T, and this. Substituting this uh, cosine theta by T, you obtain this uh, different Lorentz form. It's, a, it's a almost a Lorentz environment, not, not quite transparent, but it's basically Lorentz environment form at this one. I would not derive this for you, but you can see that. the, the uh, tr uh, geometrical function and dt d phi. So that's the, um, I can d phi 1 because of the relative one. So this is a, a different form. So you can, uh, it depends on your uh, convenience, that you can express the two-body kinematics in several different ways, see uh, whatever is uh, most convenient for you. So that's uh, the two-body kinematics. Let me see my time. Uh, almost like uh, 15 minutes. Let's uh, continue on to the uh, third one. Uh, let me see. Yeah. OK, so uh, you, you learned the lesson here already. Two body, no variable for the integration, for the energy. So the all mo energy momenta are, are fixed and given by these uh, masses, the input center mass energy. So that's the, the key point. And the well, particle one, one particle is over constrained. You have to form it. Two body, wide open, but uh, no particular uh, variable. Three body is different. Three body is one more particle in the final state. See where we write it. Let's write it here. Um, now we have a three particles in the final state. You have a three more integration variables. So remember in the two body phase space, there are two variables, phi and the theta, but you have a three more. So in principle, you have uh, uh, five integration variables there. <coughs> so if you look at the, uh, did I write uh, section one for two, and I write section three? Section two for two body, section three for three body. Okay, for that situation, then the phase space uh, expression is is a uh, standard. You have a uh, three more two pi factors, so you pull out the, the, the three more two pi factors there, and uh, the uh, energy momentum conservation is still there. And then once again, you manipulate with the many different ways for your uh, convenience. And I give you one homework assignment to work out one, which actually is an expression that Michael, gave, Michael asked you in the beginning. And that was uh, the, uh, in fact, I put that as a homework assignment already. So then you can work that out, is uh, the integration over dx a dxb. So, uh, so that's one uh, I ask you to, to try out homework. <coughs> a little bit tedious, but it's not too bad. So the final expression here, I would not give you the derivation, but uh, following some similar structure, regroup the uh, two particles and so on and so forth. Use the, uh, the delta function uh, form and so on and so forth. Finally, you end up having this uh, 4 pi 3 kinematical factor. M23 is, is a system mass, we call the invariant mass of the two, uh, two particles. 
and particle one magnitude energy one integration and uh, the from zero, zero to one angular integrations so you have a in integration variable one two three four five and these two three four five are the angular distributions one from this one from the new third free particle now un unconstrained particle so that's the two uh, solid angles okay. here is a leftover because you have only four uh, uh, constraints, energy constraints, and instead you have here uh, six of them. Therefore, one is a magnitude, one integration variable. And this integration variable tells you the three particles, the, the momentum is not fixed, it's the integration variable. Yeah. And sir, would you say the m with two indices was with like a degree? Two, three is inverse mass of particle two. In particle three, inverse mass in that in particle system, because it, it's a variable, it's not fixed. So there's this is a variable. It changes depending on the uh, other particles. Now let's uh, write down the uh, the relations first. Okay, so um, the uh, relations here, the angle in integration of course from zero to one, but I don't I don't need to give this anymore. So the uh, magnitude of this particle one center mass frame is equal to uh, P2 and P3. Because of the, uh, the particular uh, frame we're choosing. So this is a one against two or three. We sit in the frame that a one against two or three in, in this, uh, in this uh, the frame. Okay. Then, uh, of course, that you have this um, the energy relation, central, central mass energy squared minus one squared. So that's the, uh, the, the relation here. And M23 can be really uh, expressed as a central mass energy using that substitution as E CM plus M1 squared. And uh, in this uh, uh, two and three uh, uh, can be used uh, back to back uh, to define that uh, system angle. <coughs> now the, the key point here, the key, uh, key observation here is the variable for the uh, integration uh, uh, energy. So energy integration is a variable, so energy is not fixed, energy only has a maximum. Energy maximum gives you the bound for the integration area, integration region. <coughs> So that magnitude, uh, mag the integration for this, uh, uh, the energy has integration range <coughs> from zero <coughs> to this maximum. <coughs> and this maximum somewhat is similar to this one. I said that uh, this is uh, the energy is not equal between the two, for the true particle case. The heavier one contribute the plus, the lighter one, the, the other one contribute a negative. And the negative for the maximum of this guy, you want to have the minimum of this one. And that is 2 plus 3 squared. <coughs> so you can see why this reaches the maximum. In general, this is a variable, not like 2 to 2. 2 to 2, this is fixed. But uh, in uh, 2 to 3, this is a variable, but the maximum corresponds to the minimum of this environmental mass system. This is the minimum of the environmental mass system 2 to 3. Then uh, this is the, this field. So therefore, the energy in general for the particle one in the center mass frame it is value. So it's a, there's a there's a range. Okay. So now, what the dependence? Oh, I have a plot somewhere. I see. Yeah, this is one. Okay. So this is a plot. I simply uh, calculate the phase space, super phase space with arbitrary units. So here is the particle energy, the energy kinetic energy plus uh, mass, same uh, that one. So the I randomly use the three uh, values. I use the total center mass energy hundred. Okay, then each one is a one or ten GeV, twenty GeV, thirty GeV, just to show the uh, distribution. So obviously, the heavier this particle is, 
the higher energy it carries because of this, uh, this relation here. And the end point is this. This is the end point. There's a range, and uh, there's a minimum, uh, depending on the, uh, the uh, particle uh, relation there, depending on the, oh, sorry. It should not be one if we use the, uh, sorry. So it start from the, uh, start from the uh, lowest momentum uh, energy. So it's a zero momentum. Zero, uh, and it's total energy is not. Kinetic energy is a total energy is not. So this, this is the range you have. However, you look at the other one. I want to plot the kinetic energy, the motion. The kinetic energy, the total energy, like this, minus by the mass, it reverses. The more, any, the more massive particle has a lower bound. And the lighter particle has extension for the, the carries more kinetic energy. So the lighter particle it, it goes, carries more kinetic energy. That's good news for us, good or bad news, like neutrinos. Neutrino carries missing energy. Neutrino masses carries so much missing energy. That's why we discovered the W. It's a, 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 missing energy is the same as W mass over 2. It's huge. Neutrino masses. That gives you the difficulty for the massive dark matter. The more massive dark matter is, the less kinetic energy it carries. So the uh, so-called we call missing energy the wrong word, actually. So our experimental friends use the missing energy. Is it missing kinetic energy? Missing momentum is the correct one. It's a, a trigger in the, in the detector. Missing kinetic energy is less and less. You have a heavier, heavier missing particle, dark, dark matter particle. But of course, this is a tremendously important uh, historically. So this is a well-known, uh, the famous uh, expression, right? So the kinetic energy is given by this bound at maximum. The above maximum total energy minus the corresponding mass. That is given by this form minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, times minus 1 plus 2, plus 3. That's the uh, uh, expression for that one. Now let's consider a particular case. Let's randomly pick up a case. Let's randomly pick up a, a, a n to a, a p and a, and a e and a something else. Let's pick up this example. Okay. We know, we, you know what that is. So then you, you see that, uh, let's look at the energy for the outgoing easiest particle, electron. Let's look at the kinetic energy of the electron. Maximum energy follows this expression. That expression, I multiplied this uh, a few lines, that given by the parent mass, that is the root s. Root s is uh, the parent mass, in the neutral mass. And it's given by this uh, normalized form proton mass, par the daughter mass, and another daughter mass electron, neutral mass, times electron, <coughs> neutral mass, minus a linear term. Min approximately. So there's a square term, but the square term is smaller. And the minus the linear term, proton mass over neutron mass, and the third particle mass. This is the only so far the direct measurement for neutrino mass. So this, in fact, this is why this distribution, the uh, distribution is what poly uh, postulated missing particle. Three particles cannot be two, otherwise they're monochromatic. So that's poly postulated missing particle. By that time, I think he called it neutron, but later Fermi and company called it neutrino. That was uh, the postulation of neutrino because of this energy spectrum. Now let's look at the energy spectrum here for the unknown mass. We don't know, and he didn't know, know the neutrino mass. We still don't. Look at the, the expansion for this part. This is the point when neutrino is massless. Where is it? Here, here, sorry, this is zero. This is the point when neutrino is massless. This term is gone. That's the maximum. However, there is a third particle, massive particle, to shift. There's a negative shift here from three-body three body kinematics. So therefore, they'll be shifted back. So far, this is the only uh, neutrino mass measurement for the direct measurements. And you put a bound to see what uh, the mass is. So far, the neutrino mass is so little that uh, it's not resolvable to uh, the electron volts level yet. I think it's sub-electron volts already. Uh, uh, Tristan? No, no. Katrin? Katrin is, uh, we are in Germany, so 
uh, Catron is an uh, experiment to carry on the tau neutrino uh, direct measurement most sensitively. So to exactly do this uh, spectral measurement to see the, what the you can hopefully measure and discover this, or well, otherwise so far put bound on, on this. So that is three-body kinematics. So there's a variable, an energy variable in the three-body kinematics. OK, so this is about the time. <coughs> Let's uh, take a, a final uh, comment. So uh, just 10 seconds, and then we go. So uh, this is the uh, homework assignment. I want to write down the expression. And uh, you do this uh, three-body kinematics phase space I derived. And you assume this is uh, a particle rest, the particle decay at rest. Then you know the initial momentum. You know the initial momentum, and, uh, and then you can reduce the, the expression. So therefore, the expression for the three-body phase space can be further, re further simplified can be further simplified into the decay particle uh, mass, center mass energy. You know, this uh, dimensionality is uh, energy squared. And you can reduce the five-dimensional integration into two-dimensional integration. Three, integra three in additional integrations are trivial once you assume the initial state particle is a state at rest and no particular correlation. And therefore, that is, that is the expression. And then the x variable is a scaled energy over the mass. And uh, this is uh, uh, A, B, A and B. So integration uh, like this. And I ask you to, for, for simplicity and uh, take the massless limits and all the particle, final state particle masses, and, uh, and uh, discuss the integration region. So they're very, very simple. And uh, in fact, the integration region turned out to be like this. But if not, if the particles are massless, if particles are not massless, it's massive. Then you have a boundaries. And this form is exchanged to some form like this. Three body kinematics for the mass distribution. What is that? What is that? Anyone knows the name? Hmm? That is plot. So that's the Dalit plot. Two uh, integration uh, variables, mass variables for uh, 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 the particle decay at the rest. So that's the, I did not want you to go this far. I only ask you to play with this for the homework. So that's it for today. So um, uh, hopefully tonight we can discuss more about uh, the assignments and so on and so forth. Okay, thanks. Thank you.